Hello, Sue. I think she's still working on her audio. Hello. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Got to get in here. Mary's taking us for a walk. I am. I happened to be taking myself a cup of tea when I, when it came up. I didn't know it would come up that quick. I'm glad you're not upside down anymore. No, no. I, I'm sorry, what? If you would like to. <laughs> sometimes when I'm uh, this phone, I'm on my phone and sometimes it gets a little cranky and it puts me upside down instead of right, right up. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming today. We are here with Cecile Fountain. Cecile joined us kind of at the beginning of the uh, whole pandemic here. So she hasn't been able to get out into the public very much, but she is our a diversity program manager and as such she's going to be making a lot of connections in the community with folks who uh, do similar work and we hope that uh, everybody will get to know her and like her as much as we all do here at Vine and with that I will turn it over to Cecile and I will mute my microphone. Well hello everyone and um, welcome and thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, hopefully, technology will be cooperating with both of us, Mike and I. And um, I just want to start by saying a big thank you to Mike, because um, without him, I think none of this will be happening right now. Um, so he, I would say, did 80% of the work, I just have to look nice and um, do the presentation. Um, in addition, of course, to the information, but he did all the fancy stuff and the technology stuff. So um, I will start by um, saying that I'm just so happy to be here. And I am very lucky to be here both in America and in Vine, I mean at Vine. Um, I am, for those who don't know me, I'm originally from Sudan um, and Sudan is in Africa. Not as many people think that Sudan, because it ends with an A-N, that it's in Afghanistan or Pakistan or any of this then. No, Sudan is in Africa. And I remember when I first moved to the US, I was in Chicago for a couple of years. And uh, when I would meet people and say, um, I am from Sudan and they don't know where Sudan is, I used to be shocked because Sudan is like one of the largest country in uh, one of the largest countries in the whole world. Um, I think um, we stand at like the 15th largest country. Um, however, so uh, I came to the U, I immigrated to the US back in 2003. And coming to the US, it took um, about eight years of trying um, as a family, five years as a family, and three years as an individual. And I came through um, a program called the Diversity Visa. The Diversity Visa is a lottery program that the U.S. offers um, to um, for immigration. And uh, your chances to get that Diversity Visa to um, immigrate to the U.S. and become, um, a, a, a when you first come, you are a, a resident, um, your chances are one out of 150,000 people. 
And that program goes through three phases and all three phases is lottery, meaning random picking. So you, you fill out the document, you send it and you wait around three months. And then if you get lucky, you get a response. And then they tell you if you're lucky that you got the visa um, or if you don't hear after three months, then you automatically know that you did not get picked. And then the second round is um, the F so the first round, you're one of the 150,000 people. The second round is 100,000 people receive another envelope with the same form. You fill that out, you send it, and then th you wait another three months. And if you're lucky, then you get another letter saying, congratulations, you made it to the second round. Um, sorry, to the third round. And then the third round, only 50,000 people will get an envelope that says, um, you need to do your medical check and um, after them and you fill more documents and then from the 50,000 if you make it to the last round after they do after they check your medical then you qualify for an interview so I was one of those lucky people in the, the hundred thousand immigrants that got picked to this program and we applied as a family from 2000, from 1993 up until 1998. And when my youngest sister and I turned 18, we applied individually for three years. And then in 2001, I was the lucky one who got picked. And, you know, after doing the three rounds and making it to the final round and to do the interview. So three months, three months, and three months, that was nine months. So it made it to 2002. And I did the interview and I finally moved to the US back in 2003. However, um, it, I came to the US um, in 2003 and I went to Chicago just because 10 years before my brother had moved to the US after he got a scholarship to go to Marquette University and that's where he was after he finished Marquette University in Wisconsin he moved and worked in Chicago and that's how when I came in 2003 I stayed with him in Chicago and um, I would say coming fr straight from Africa, Chicago is not the best state to, to land at um, because I would always say landed in Chicago for me back then, it's almost like landing in Mars because everything was different. The people is different. The people were different. The culture, again, I'm not talking Chicago culture, I'm talking American culture. So uh, I lived in Chicago for two, two years, and then I moved to Mankato in 2005. And a lot of people here in Mankato know me as Cecile Gissis because that was my maiden name before I got married in 2011. I lived in Mankato from 2005 to 2009 and I went to South Central even though when I was in Sudan I went to a five years um, college and the university I went to is called Ahfad University for Women and it's mainly for women um, and that um, school that university is one of the uh, kind of popular um, kind of, uh, what is it called, private, and also one of the oldest universities because it was established during Sudan was colonized by the British uh, in the early 1900. So um, the university I went to, um, the curriculum is in English. However, that does not mean that everybody there speaks English. I mean, the professor will go in the class and he will 
do the whole lecture in Arabic, but then he will use all the terminologies in English. And then he would read whatever definition or um, the uh, scientific terminologies in English and, and then everything goes into Arabic. So I believe that I know English, so moving to America should be a piece of cake. Well, that was not the reality. So to take you from, from where I'm from until where I am now, we're gonna start the slideshow. Mike, you ready? It's nice to have um, you, whoever is holding the, in charge of the technology right there at the back. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Okay. I will try to start this thing now. And I'll, I'll try and uh, stay focused. So we won't take two days instead of an hour. Hmm. Okay. Uh, um, can you all see the PowerPoint or the slides? Okay. Okay, so um, starting um, with Sudan. So Sudan, as you can see, it's right there. It's so big. It's in the northeast of Africa. You can't miss it. Um, and uh, this is, by the way, Sudan before the split. Um, Sudan, uh, it's kind of sits like at the northeast of Africa. And we got the Red Sea right there to the east. Um, back then, and this is up till 2011, in July 2011, um, Sudan got split to Sudan and South Sudan. Sudan, up until this point, uh, up until um, before the split, we were surrounded by Egypt and Libya on the north, and then Chad and the Central Africa on the west. And then we have the Republic of Congo and Uganda and Kenya to the south. And then we got Ethiopia and Eritrea um, on the east. And right on top of Eritrea, you see that white thing to the right, that's the Red Sea. And then on the other side of the Red Sea, that's Saudi Arabia. So we're fairly close to the Middle East, you know, or the Gulf countries, um, the Saudi, the um, Bahrain, Kuwait, Dubai, all these are fairly close uh, to Sudan, um, which you'll see, which you probably know a lot of um, Arab speaking countries uh, in Africa, men tend to um, immigrate to to those countries because they're rich in oil and the um, the the what do you call it? the conditions there are much better than Africa. But this is Sudan and all the neighboring countries. So back then we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, um, nine countries surrounding Sudan. Um, and then, like I said, after the split, that got changed. So, um, next slide, Mike, please. Okay, so this is Sudan now after the split. And now you can see that it became Sudan on the north and then South Sudan um, on the south. And then Sudan, um, I forgot to mention that the capital is Khartoum and for South Sudan, the capital is Juba. And um, Khartoum has a story which will come in the following slides that I would tell you about. But this is here a, a close up look that tells you where all the other neighboring countries um, and how um, uh, the borders kind of line up uh, compared to Sudan. Um, and you were also, the one thing I want you to notice that the, the blue line that 
um, it's two separate lines, one coming from the south and one coming from the east, and then it goes all up as one line, and that's the River Nile. And next, Mike, please. Okay. In Sudan, believe it or not, we have pyramids. So the Egyptians um, cannot say that the, they are known for their pyramids and that they're only country who have pyramids. We have pyramids too. As a matter of fact, our pyramids are older and we have um, 22 times the pyramids that they have in Egypt. Our pyramids are in um, Meroe on different places in Meroe and Meroe kind of sits to the north of Khartoum. Next slide, um, Mike. Um, please forgive me if I am jumping or I'm all over. Um, the information is not kind of in, in the, the right sequence, but- If you'd you like, I can try to retrieve the other slide, slideshow. The one? The, the updated slideshow, I yeah. think. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. So, uh, how is everybody keeping up? Are you all still awake? Anybody taking a snooze? <laughs> okay, it's glad to see lots of smiles. Oh. Okay, no worries. So, um, I hope you all got your coffee, those who drink coffee. I was amazed that there are some people who do not, a lot of people don't drink coffee in this office. <laughs> um, I literally cannot function without coffee. Um, I said I need the caffeine to be able to speak two languages. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I just need that to get started in the morning. Yeah. Cecile, yes. Yeah, I know. I need, um, um, I can drink my coffee and go straight to bed. It won't bother me. Oh. So you're uh, throughout the day. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, I'm pretty much morning, but got to have that. Yes. But there are folks who enjoy their, their pop as well as I enjoy my coffee. So. Oh. Yes. And, you know, I come from a country where people drink more tea. Than, oh, okay. But when I moved to mm. the States, um, let me see, tea was a little bit of a hassle. So when, you know, back in 2003, when I go to like, I don't know, McDonald's and ask for tea, they look at you <laughs> like, which planet are you from? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Ice tea when it's zero degrees out, right? Yeah. Well, see, I come from a country where tea and coffee are hot. Yes. Your juice and pop are cold. Yes. So when I heard that people here drink cold coffee, oh, I just could not understand <laughs> that. I'm like, you know, they're called hot drinks. So, yes. Um, okay. No problem, Mike. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, let me see. So um, I'll give you the information till we get back the slides. Um, I just want to tell you that Sudan, the name Sudan actually has a meaning. Um, Sudan, um, in Arabic, Sud is, or Aswad means black. Um, so Sudan uh, comes from um, the meaning the the land of the blacks, so that's what that's why um, Sudan. Like if people ask, like does your country have a meaning? Yes, it does. Sudan means land of the black, uh, or in Arabic, it's a bilad a sud. Sud is black. Um, the other thing. Um, I want you to know about Sudan is that um, we were colonized twice. The first time we were colonized by the Tur Turks, um, the Turkish Ottoman, 
Um, and then, and the second time we were um, colonized, it was a dual uh, colony. It was the Great Britain and Egypt. Um, and as you can see on the slide, the Ottoman Empire conquered the north part of Sudan and um, it, um, Egypt was also one of the colon, um, part of the Ottoman Empire. And you will see a lot of the Egyptian culture and the Northern Sudan culture is highly affected by the Ottoman Empire or the Turkish culture. Um, we have a lot that, you know, um, a lot of names, a lot of um, words, a lot of uh, habits or culture that we um, kept from the Turkish time. Um, we, the first, like in the 18th century, or we were, uh, the 17th century, we were um, under the Ottoman Empire, and then from 1899 to until 1955, we were under the British Egyptian rule, and we got our in, independency um, in 1956. These are just some um, dates that I thought were, have, you know, big stuff happened uh, on those times. Um, Sudan, um, we had so many different governments, um, but one of the main governments um, wanted to um, introduce the Sharia law, which is the Islamic law into the country. Well, if you know Sudan, Sudan is one of the most diverse uh, population, uh, populated country. We have 500 different um, tribes. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about, you know, together Sudan and Southern Sudan. So, and with, within those 500 different tribes, I would say um, majority on the North are um, influenced by the Arabs. But if you take, you know, the West, the East and the South, there are, they're mainly um, uh, like, uh, what do you call them, different religion, different tribes, not very influenced by the Arab culture. So for the, the government to, to try and enforce that kind of law was, um, was just very uh, hard for the whole country. So let's move on to 2003. And that's, when a lot, that's what a lot of people know, which is the conflict in Darfur. And... Um, Darfur actually is one of the biggest uh, states in Sudan, and it's towards the west of Sudan. And the Darfur, the conflict was pretty much two tribes um, didn't like the government um, kind of try to force them in, to Arabize, and uh, they start fighting um, each other. And then the government sent militia to kind of um, get rid of everyone and kind of everybody that's against the government, against the Sharia law, against the Islamic law to just be wiped out. Um, and that uh, was kind of the, um, it was a big crime against the whole humanity because it was, you know, it was just racial um, cleansing for some of those tribes. In 2011 um, is when um, so Southern Sudan decided to be a completely separate country, uh, completely independent from um, the whole Sudan. And then in 2019, just last year, is when we finally got rid of the last government that was in that was ruling for 30 years with the dictator um, Omar. Um, um, Al Bashir uh, was his last name. Um, after for the last two years, people were just struggling to just have basic needs, which is water, electricity, food. I mean, bread uh, or flour to just have bread. And that's when um, there were so many demonstration and uprising, and they said enough is enough, and 
now we're actually in a period of uh, transitioning. Okay, next, Mike, please. As I said, um, Sudan is, um, sits at the 15th largest country in the world. Um, we were the third largest country in Africa. And then at the bottom, there is a link. Um, you can click on that link, please, Mike. Did it work? Yeah, it opened up and it's just not opened up completely yet. Okay. And if I'm correct, this uh, slide or this link should show you just an estimate of when you compare how big Sudan to America. Um, we can just move to the next slide, Mike. It is opening up. It's oh, okay. Okay. Everybody's still awake? All right. Kelly, you still there? I'm here. And what I'm wondering is, um, because of the size of Sudan, yes. Um, what is the frequency of travel from Sudan to the area county countries? It's, it's very frequent. It's okay. very frequent. Um, uh, and usually the the travel is um, for Sudanese trying to find opportunities out of Sudan just because of the challenges that they have in Sudan. Um, and because um, the poverty in Sudan, they're always trying to go to, let's say, let's say Egypt, that's doing a little bit better but mainly to towards the Gulf countries or the Arab countries um, to find better opportunities. Okay. But within the country, there is a lot of um, traveling because like you will see later on that the education, most of the, the resources are in Khartoum, in the capital city. So you'll see a lot of people come from the rural, rural areas to Sudan for education, for, um, you know, better opportunities, for a, a better lifestyle, for, um, you know, just um, to better, uh, to have a better life for their families as well. Yes, and usually, it's, yeah. It, it's large, looking at that population of 42 million. Yes. Wow. Yep. And you will see here, I put that you know, a lot of people speak Arabic, but because um, we were colonized by the British and the British helped us, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, put out the education system, the documentation system, the registration system, you know, kind of um, helped us uh, found the country or organize the country on, on a, a civilized way. Um, and because they, they helped us do that, everything has been um, operating uh, in, in the British, like with the British system or following the British system. So um, like our schooling was the same as the British, the, the documentation, the registration, everything like we still, like we do, when we come to put the date, it's the day, the month, and the year versus here, you put the month, the date, and the year. Um, it, so th that's how it's done. Also, we go primary school, secondary school, and then senior school, where here you have elementary, and then junior, and then high, high school. So that's the difference that we have. Um, for uh, in some, um, we also in the education system, we have, um, you have to uh, have a, like a, a state exam to go from primary to junior. And again, another one to go from high school to college. 
Um, so so when, when you're finished with primary, you have to sit for exam um, to go from, from uh, eighth grade to, um, to senior, um, to senior high. How are we doing, Mike? Oh. Did it, did it open? The link? I, I, I showed the size one for quite some time. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so we'll move to the next one. And, um, and here also on this slide, you see Islam is the majority now after Sudan got separated, but before it used to be, you know, um, I mean, Islam was like at 75% and then we had the 35% was Christianity and also um, other tribal beliefs. Um, you, you also see here the life expectancy is 63 years for men and 66 for women. Um, the currency that we have is Sudanese pound, which is also uh, influenced by the um, British culture or the British system. Next, Mike. All right. So this is pretty much this, the stuff that I already spoke about. Um, uh, the conflict that happened or the war that happened in Sudan, we had two civil wars. And unfortunately, those two civil wars took the lives of 2.5 million. Um, and then in, just in the Darfur area, 200,000 people got killed. Um, to give you a sense of how poor Sudan is, um, until 2009, um, the individual can, can, is able to spend um, $3.20. Um, and that's all that they would have per day to spend. Um, and um, here, just a little bit about the politics and, and how um, they affected the economy um, because of, you know, trying to use the religion to suppress a lot of um, the civilians. And then when we had the, the separation of the, the country that affected the country even worse because the oil was mainly in the south. So now the people, the the, the economy is now is a, a, a mainly dependent on ag agriculture at this point. Okay, next, please, Mike. So this is just to give you a little bit of, of that's how big Darfur in Sudan. So it takes pretty much all the way from the Northwest to the whole West and a, um, a little bit of the South. Um, and you know, this is pretty much what I mentioned about what the conflict was. We can move to the next one, Mike. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the culture in Sudan. As I said, we have um, 578 um, ethnic groups. Um, we have over, we have around 145 different languages. But let me tell you, 70%, I'm talking about Sudan, 70% is Arabic because that's what the, um, most of the population on the northern uh, on Sudan, that's what they speak is Arabic. And then we have 30% of the other tribes, but the main language in the north is Arabic. And what I'm showing down here, the pictures is um, how, you know, the, the different um, celebration and music and um, instrument that they use. And as you see, because of the Arab culture, um, influence in Sudan, m the segregation is, is very visible. So you see like the men are together, the women are together, um, and um, like, you know, the, the women get together and they sing and they dance uh, on special occasions like weddings. Um, and men, the, the time they get together and they sing like the one on, on the far left, 
that's usually that's one of uh, the the parties of the um, the Muslims. It's one division called Sufia, and um, or Suf the Sufis, and they um, they pretty much get together every Friday, and after the Friday prayer, they will just chant and sing, and they will pray, play the drums. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much the scene when you go there. Um, and the one in the middle, that's this, the Sudanese um, musician, not Sudan, but um, some of the women that get together and mainly during weddings um, and they just, you know, they play the drums and they sing and usually uh, is to get the, the the bride to practice the traditional dancing that she will perform um, on her wedding. And uh, you will see later that we have two weddings. We have the traditional wedding, and then we have what we call it the modern wedding. And then on the, on the right, the far right, that's the traditional uh, drums that, that are made in Sudan or the Sudanese or African drums. Okay, next, please. So like I said, we come in all different shades and shapes. And so as you can see, the one on, on the far left, she's a writer and she's lighter skin. Uh, the one in the middle, are from a tribe called the Bija. And what they do is they raise camels and then they will travel for a good um, three to five days to go from um, uh, East or Northeast Sudan all the way to Egypt, to Southern Egypt to sell their camel. But I'm gonna open up for you, and I want you to guess how much they would sell the one camel. So take your guess. Um, I'll start by uh, Deb. What's your guess how much they would sell per camel? A mute. And mute yourself so we can hear your guess. In like U.S. dollars? Yes. Mm, I think a camel would cost like $4,500. $4,500. Wow. Yeah. We won't With be poor. We won't be poor if we can sell it for them. <laughs> oh. Okay. I'll, I'll give it to Kelly. I'm guessing... Um, I'm guessing that maybe a good price that the shepherd would get, is that what I would call him a shepherd? Yes. Um, that he would get $15 per camel. 15, all right. Over there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mom and grandma, any guesses? We think about $100. $100, all right. Mary? I have to marry. Well, 100, 100 is what I came up with also, but let's go 200. Okay. All right. Any, anybody else? Going once. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not, it's around $1,500 per camel. Wow. wow. Good. So, so it is worth the, the, what do you call it, the ride for three to five days to go all the way. And, you know, they camp outside. Um, and, you know, it's not like they, as you can see, I don't think they have campers. So <laughs> you're literally in the wild, in the desert. So how many camels would they have So that they're uh, herding and taking to market then? So they'll be herding around uh, 40 to 60 camels and they go with them. They herd them all the way um, for like three to five days. And if they sell 10 or more for them, it's worth um, the effort. So do they, how, how often do camels have baby camels? I mean, um, 
I mean, there are, do they have babies every year? Yes. To replace these camels? Yes. Yep, they do. Okay. The, it's just, I don't know exactly how many times they go or they travel, but I would assume they would have like special seasons where, when they can actually do that. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And the last picture on the right, this is a Nubian um, rapper or singer uh, who is Sudanese and Nubian are the north um, the very far north, almost southern Egypt. Okay, next one, Mike. So, so I got a question. Yes, With all of the different shades, um, colors that you see there, do you run into the racial issues there that, like what they do here in the United States? That's a, a, a really wonderful question. Actually, no. What we have the discrimination that we have there, it's tribal. Um, it's tribal, it's um, uh, actually tribal and religious. Um, is the, that's what the discrimination um, that would happen um, in, in Sudan and also in uh, um, various countries in Africa, for example, Egypt. Like Egypt is a big, um, their biggest struggle is the discrimination uh, between religions. Um, but in Sudan, for example, and you'll see Sudan and let's say West Africa, East Africa and um, the Southern part of Africa, our, the main discrimination is tribal, you know, whose tribe is stronger whose tribe is richer, you know, um, and, and that's where the discrimination would come from. Which that was one of the things that surprised, surprised slash shocked me when I first moved here, because I said, I come from one of the poorest country in Africa, but race is not, you know, was never, because that's something you cannot change, you know? If you're from a rich tribe, okay, well, you're rich, you have something, you know, to be proud of, that you're better than the rest because your tribe is rich, but skin color, you can't change that. I mean, you have absolutely no control over it. So uh, for me, uh, it was like a big shock. Um, so um, on this slide, here are more shades and shapes as you can see on the right side these are from the east part of sudan um, and uh, they are um, they also are very uh, tribal where even their arabic is not like um, the same arabic like we have in khartoum um, their arabic is a little bit influenced by the Egyptian and the Saudis because there was the Red Sea. Um, so, and then on the one on the top, that's a student um, in Khartoum, a college student, you know, that's usually what they would dress like, very conservative, long sleeves, long dresses, and, um, and, a, a, head, and a head cover. On the one at the bottom right, that's usually the western and, and west-south part of Sudan. Um, and, you know, again, they do all different kind of tribal stuff like body painting, body piercing, um, body tattooing. Um, and, and like I said, we have over 578 different tribes. So you can imagine how, I mean, I can fill up like, I don't know, 70 more um, slides with picture of the different tribes. Okay, we can move to the next slide, please, Mike. And this is a picture would be um, of the Nile, if you are in Khartoum in, in one of the high buildings, that would be a picture of the Nile. Um, 
we can move to the next one. And this is what I wanted to tell you about Khartoum and the Nile. Because a lot of people are, they know the River Nile, but they don't know, like, they don't know that before it becomes the River Nile, it's actually two separate Niles. It, there is the Blue Nile that comes, as you can see, from the east, and it comes from Ethiopia, from a lake called Lake Tana. And it goes from Lake Tana in Ethiopia all the way down to Khartoum. And then the White Nile that comes from the south, uh, with, from Uganda, from a lake called Lake Victoria. And um, so it goes, it comes from the south and it goes all the way to Khartoum. And if you look at the other picture, it can show you exactly how they merge. Um, and you can see uh, the, the darker shade um, is actually the, the blue Nile and the lighter shade is the white Nile. And as you can see when they're merging, it's so clear that one is lighter than the other. Can you all see that? And from that, so that city right there um, is, the, um, is Khartoum. Khartoum in Arabic also has a meaning. Khartoum means trunk. Trunk and the, and the reason why it was called Khartoum or a trunk, because if you bend your head a little bit to the left, you will see that, the, that it looks like an elephant trunk where the head are the two Niles and they go as one big trunk as the one river Nile. And that's how it becomes the river Nile. But that's why Khartoum is called Khartoum. It's called the trunk because these two Niles go one as the river Nile. The one piece of information I want you to know is that the Nile is the primary water source for Egypt and Sudan. Um, and these are the pyramids that I spoke about it earlier um, that they're also, I mean, they're, Meroe is the area um, where the pyramids are. And we had, um, uh, what do you call it? One of the, what is it? How do you say it in, in English? The cu cushion? Cu yeah. The cushion? The cushion? Cushions? The, no, the, the emperor. Okay, we have one of the emperors, um, empires that were around before or after the pharaonic um, emperor empire. It was right there in Meroe, and that's how the the Nubian built those pyramids. And maybe you guys can help me it's called the ancient one of the kingdoms sorry not um empires it's um it's is one it of one of the seven wonders the no kingdoms no one of the very primitive kingdoms um it was right after the pharaonic i think or before the pharaonic um ancient time. Um, but those pyramids were built um, around the same time as the pyramids in Egypt. So who, who built those pyramids? I mean, I know they were built in, in Sudan, but who actually did the building? Like the, I believe it was, um, slaves or whatever that built the pyramids in, in Egypt. Do you know who built these? The Nubians. The, the people, Nubians. The, yeah, the Nubians that lived and um, were living in um, Meroe during that time, in the, during the, the kingdom. Um, which, okay. 
it's I don't know if you can see it. It's spelled Q U Kushite. Yes, Kushite Kingdom. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Can we move to the next one? Yes. So when I spoke about now we're depending on the agriculture in uh, now that most of the oil is in South Sudan. Sudan is known for the world largest producer for gum Arabic. And I did some um, um, search on what, it, what does it do. It's, um, it's used mainly uh, for glue and watercolor paints and also for incense. Um, the other uh, uh, agriculture um, that we, Sudan is rich with is cotton um, and uh, peanuts, sorghum, um, sugar cane, um, mangoes, papaya, bananas, which I was, when, I remember when I first moved here, I was so surprised how expensive mangoes are bananas because in Sudan, we call bananas um, the poor's fruit because it's so cheap that even poor people can go buy bananas. And I was so surprised how expensive it is. So if I have $3 to spend for, you know, for my family to get, to get food, um, I would say banana will cost me like 20 cents to get one kilo of, or, or like two pounds of bananas will be like 20 cents in Sudan. Um, you will see that we have sheep and livestock and that's that's another um, big thing that we have in Sudan that we are really really rich with sheep and livestock um, but yet we're still using it as an export and but you know the people of Sudan are not really getting much of it next please and this is just a picture if you're ever in Sudan walking in the streets, you'll see that we sell the newspaper. A guy will be walking around selling the newspaper from um, six o'clock in the morning up until one. Um, and if you get um, yours while, you know, while you're stopping at the traffic light, you can get one. And, you, and uh, after one o'clock, then you will just have to stop at a, um, a book bookstore or a book shack and then you buy one. Next please. Um, we, because we're, we're on the um, sub-Saharan area, the water shortage is one of our biggest struggle. So people will go miles and miles to just go get water from a well, as you can see, and that's in the rural areas. And that's why people tend to travel to Khartoum. But they will get, that's how they will um, fill their water and take it home, boil it, or um, use uh, filters to filter that water and then drink it. Next, please. This is the supermarket in Sudan. That's how the supermarkets are. So when I first moved in 2003 and I went with my brother to Walgreens, I called War Walgreens a mall. And I was calling my family and say, I went to the mall in the US and it's huge. It's called Walgreens. <laughs> and I'm comparing that to the supermarket. That's before I even made it to any mall. But, you know, so this is pretty much all the options that you have. And then you walk in the candy aisle at Walgreens and it's like a never ending options of chocolate. I ate chocolate, chocolates um, when I first, I actually worked at that Walgreens that just to tell you how much fascinated I was. Um, um, I ate uh, every day for breakfast, I had carrot cake and for lunch I had Snickers and um, I had a Hershey's bar and that was my lunch and I just was so determined to try all the chocolates that they have at Walgreens 
which I paid for it later, of course. Um, however, so that's the supermarket. That's the typical supermarket you'll see in Sudan. No air condition. If you can see, the ceiling is made out of metal and there is no air condition. There is that little fan that would sit right there and that as much air condition as he will get. <laughs> Next, please. Um, I spoke about how we had a dictator of 30 years who was trying to enforce the Sharia law. Um, and then back in 2018, um, you're moving too fast, Mike. Um, I made a mistake. <laughs> um, that's when the uprise and that's when people said enough is enough because they were not, they couldn't even get bread in the bakeries to eat. Um, and then there was no gas, even though we had tons of gas and people said enough is enough and everybody was on the street. And that the one on the right actually is one of my friends and you can see the way she's dressed versus the traditional Sudanese way um, how they're dressed. Next. So this is how hot it gets in Sudan. So we're going to go to the average, which is the second um, line. Uh, yep, thank you, Mike. So if you see where these are going by, we're going to go January, February. So um, let's see, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. July is right, yep, right there. So that's the average high in July. So when it's 88 here and people saying, oh my God, it's hot. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> this is like nice breeze. <laughs> yeah. And then let's go to the lowest it gets in the winter time. And the average low is 60. So and the lowest it ever have gotten in Sudan is 46.4 degrees. So it's not that bad in here. You see that? So um, I would say weather-wise, we're not doing too bad winter time. Um, we can, can we move to the next one, please? All right, but let's talk about major climate change that happens in Sudan every now and then. Here you have um, snowstorm and you have tornadoes. We have our sand, not snow, sand storms. And um, as you can see, it's a gigantic cloud of dust. And let me tell you, that dust is so fine. However, because of the wind, the wind can pretty much blow from dust to dirt to rocks all the way. Um, I mean, all the way over. And that actually storm is called Habub. Um, it's H-A-B-O-O-B. So make sure you add the H-A at the beginning. Um, and these, um, that's fine. So, and this is Khartoum at night. Looks pretty nice, but that's when we have power. Um, these days, we are struggling with power. And as you know, because we rely on water and our powers are actually generated from the dams that we have um, along the Nile. So during the dry, uh, the, the um, summer season where there are, there's not enough water, it affects the power. So we can go hours and hours with no power in 101 degrees. So next one. And Again, this is our airport. As you can see, it's pure desert and um, it's dry heat. So what happens is 
as bad as you think it is, guess what? It's pretty hot, but you sweat and that sweat cools you down. So it's not as bad. The humidity is, um, that would make it 10 times worse. But let me tell you, I survived 23 years right there. I lived, I turned out just fine. I'm still alive, fully functioning. This is our traffic. So when, when, as you can see, that was a bit of, that was another culture shock for me. You see, everybody is in the street. There is no such thing as sidewalk. And as you can see, there are not like very obvious lines where people can stay in lanes. And, um, and then, you know, people there, cars are there, um, th that's, that's pretty much the, um, the normal life in Sudan. Next. Um, this is pretty much the, arch um, the architecture um, in Sudan. You'll see that most of the buildings are, you know, the roof is flat. Uh, all the buildings are built with cement and bricks. And the reason why they, they do that is because they retain um, the, the cold um, temperature inside um, and keeping the, the heat outside. Next. And this is one of the big mosques in Sudan and it's right in the center of Khartoum, right in the middle of Khartoum. And as you see, see how the cars are parked all kind of randomly, you know, you park wherever you want to park and, you know, you just have to figure out how you're going to get your car if someone is blocking you. And um, Next. And that's uh, another mosque um, at night. And you'll see a lot of people in there. And that's usually if it's on a Friday prayer or if there is a, a wedding um, or if it's during Ramadan. Next. This is the biggest cathedral we have in Khartoum. It's called St. Matthew. And it's in an absolute location because it looks over the River Nile and right where the two Niles meet, the Blue Nile and the White Nile. And here are some greens. So you do see some greens every now and then along the Nile shores. Um, and Let's, and as I said, uh, for education, this is one of the biggest universities. It's called University of Khartoum. Um, and I, we can move to the next one, Mike. As I spoke that, you know, um, most of the education bodies is in Khartoum. And that's why a lot of people will travel or uh, during, when the school is in session, a lot of them come from, um, the rural areas to um, Khartoum for, for education. And as I said, kindergarten and daycare are together um, and and they go up to, we don't have babies going to daycare. The earliest you'll go to a daycare is when you're three. So three to four years old, that's kindergarten and daycare. Um, and then we have one to second grade, all depending on parents. So if parents want to keep their child till like eight and then they go to school, then we don't have something that, you know, forces them by law to take their kids to school. Um, elementary age is six to seven and we have um, up until eighth grade. And then you have to sit for an exam or take an exam um, to go from eighth grade to um, to high school, to, you know, uh, to junior, sorry, not high school, to go to junior. Um, so, and that would be an after you go to junior, you are in junior for three years, and then you take another exam to go to high school. And then, um, from high school to college, you have to take um, higher education exam to, to be able to get to universities. 
Um, the education in Sudan is, is very strong, um, as I said, um, because it was very influenced by the British and they established the education system for us. <coughs> we also were so lucky to get also a big influence from the missionaries and the missionaries are uh, European missionaries, mainly Italians. And they started a lot of the Catholic schools in Sudan. Um, and up until now, Catholic schools in Sudan um, are like second best schools. The, um, the first um, best schools are European schools or Western school, but then second best are the Catholic schools. Um, and I, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, if you bring something that proves that your ancestors are from European descent, Italian, French, German, then they will, um, then you would qualify to take those languages at school. So my, like I have a distant relatives that had um, French and Italian um, ancestors and they, when they graduated from high school, they already spoke English and Arabic, French and Italian, uh, fluently reading, writing, um, and speaking. Um, the, unfortunately, the education um, system got changed um, two times. First time in the 80s when they wanted to enforce the Sharia law where they said, oh, we're an Arab country, we're a Muslim country, everything should be in Arabic. And then in the 90s, when they said, we don't want to go anymore with the, with the British, where you have to do six years primary, and then uh, three junior and three high. They did eight um, elementary, and then they went um, three junior and three high. Next, please. And um, this is the family and, and marriage. Um, where we believe that families are of, often um, living together, uh, like spouses and this, um, what do you call it? Distant family, extended families. I mean, like uh, if I get married, then I can live with my mom and dad. And then later on, when we start having kids, we can move out. But even when we move out, we always try to live close to the parents. And as I said, we do the traditional wedding, which is the one on the left, and then the modern wedding, which is the one on the right. Next, please. Um, marriages are traditionally arranged by parents. And um, it's like I said, usually it's either tribes to try, we try to be in the same tribe um, or, or also by class. Um, if we're from a well-educated class, then we try to marry someone from the same class. Next, please. Next, please. That's the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and then, <laughs> sorry, Mike. Um, and then, like, I remember I got married in 2011, and my husband, when he came to ask my hand from my dad, uh, well, first of all, I'm married to an American, like pure American. He's um, from Texas. When he proposed, when he went on one knee and proposed, I was so happy and so excited. And I said, yes, but I said, you have to ask my hand from my brother who lives in Chicago. And um, so he did that. He, he drove to Chicago, met my brother, introduced himself and asked my hand. And then it happened that my uncle was in Minnesota. And I said, well, you know, he's um, considered the elder in the family. So you need to come and, and ask my hand from him. So he did that. And then three months later, my parents came and I said, well, my parents are here. Then you have to come and ask my hand from them. So he, came and I remember 
it was just very awkward because um, I, I told them you have to be very patient and you have to be very, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what's the word? Like be prepared that you could be asked any kind of question. Um, so, you know, my dad asked him if he went to college and if he has a college degree and he asked him if he goes to church and he asked him if he um, has a, a proper job and if he also, um, if his parents are still married and he asked him, um, he almost did a background check on him. Um, um, anyway. So that, that's usually what parents will ask, like, are you economically, um, financially stable and can handle a family and be responsible for them? Um, and in Sudan, um, the, the family or the bride, they, they expect that the, the groom will buy jewelry, clothes, furniture, just to name a few things of what he, he has to provide before the wedding. Next. So uh, just to tell you like um, what kind of problems that we have in, in Sudan, um, as you know, the Darfur, and we have the, the pro protesting that was happening. Um, and we have, you know, a lot of tortures that happens if, if you go against the um, uh, political parties or the government, um, we have uh, harassment. And again, that, that's because it's, it's generated from the Arab culture slash um, less education from the government side um, where it, the, the, the government may make it kind of sound like men are better than women and um, they try to use the law to enforce that that women should just stay at home um, and they don't need education and they, they don't need jobs and that they're pretty much subordinates um, restriction and meet on the media sexual violence and discrimination um, a woman could be easily harassed on, on the street or in public transportation. Um, and, you know, that's, that kind of happens a lot. Freedom of religion, again, when we talk about discrimination, when they see you are um, not Muslim, if you're Christian or a, a non-believer, then um, automatically you get discriminated against. Um, refugees and migrants, when when the war was happening in, in Darfur and in southern Sudan, a lot of people used to go to Khartoum, but they were kind of looked down upon or they were treated really bad, um, um, almost like slaves, pretty, not slaves, but kind of like um, at the bottom of the scale, pretty much. Next. And I thought these were kind of fun things to know. It will be fun to know that uh, if you were to compare Sudan uh, to the United States. Um, so if you were to live in Sudan, expect to die 16 years young, um, sooner, um, and you're uh, 8.6 times more likely to die as an infant, uh, in case you're not depressed enough from corona. Um, <laughs> um, you're 2.2 times too likely to be unemployed, you will make 95% less money. <laughs> and, um, but look at this one. You will spend 98% less money on healthcare, which in a different way saying, good luck finding a doctor. Um, and then uh, you will consume way less oil and you will definitely use 98% um, less electricity, um, you know, you're 92% less likely to be in prison. How good is that? Um, and 71% more likely to be murdered in Sudan versus the US. And um, 
I just, I mean, um, I thought when I was reading it, it was for me, it's um, kind of uh, funny, but it's actually sad that I'm reading it now. Next, please. This is just um, a video. I thought it would be fun if you watch it to just tell you here, this is an American guy who decided to go see Sudan. So if you wanna, um, top one, top one the top one, one yes. Hard. Okay, no worries. So I apologize. I think I took way more than um, I thought I would. I thought I'd take around 40 minutes, but I think I think I took over an hour. Um, but I blame part of it in the technology, so I won't take <laughs> the whole blame. Um, this is pretty much, you know, what I wanted you to know. Sorry. It's okay. I'll, I'll keep talking till the video is ready. Um, I just wanted you to have an idea of where I came from and um, as far as, you know, the, the country, the culture, the background. Um, and I also want, you know, I would tell you that when I first came to the U.S., it was so hard that I thought I will never make it here. Are you not hearing that? Sure. It's not showing. Is the video showing to any of you? No. Sorry. Oh, it's, it's not showing. Sure. <laughs> no. Sorry, I've got the. Okay. All right. Let's see. So, so Cecile, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, given the um, the average age of death, mm -hmm. what is considered? What age is considered an elder um, in Sudan? I would say sixty would be considered an elder. Okay, and we got the video. Okay, can you all see the video okay? All right. Yes. Are you hearing it or me? No. no volume. No, no one can hear it either. Okay. So, oh, because it, okay. Can we restart? Can you restart? Still no volume? I can't hear it. Can you all, yeah, no. No, no. That's funny because it's coming through loud and clear for me. Okay. Still nothing? Nope. Seems bizarre, I don't know. Because it's very loud for me. I could uh, <laughs> tell you what it's saying. Is there a volume on the share screen? No. Oh. Well, I thought, I was hoping that would help. No? Okay. Well, the video is pretty much about this American guy from Arizona who went to Sudan and he wanted to know what $10 will uh, buy him or um, how like ten dollars how how um how many things can he get for ten dollars in in Sudan and he was just so surprised because him and his crew there were him and four other people and they got tea and they bought um lunch and they took two rides and one boat ride and um okay and they they did all that and then at the end of the day he had only spent six dollars 48 cents i think so he took the rest of the money and gave it to some of the homeless kids that were on the streets so, it's okay um i'll keep talking till we get it all sorted out um so what i wanted to say is when you picture when when you look at all that and um when i first came here is the video showing? I mean, can you hear it? No. no we can hear it. Okay. Yeah, I, I found the share on the screen, but it didn't. Uh... Okay. 
putting these coins away together here. Okay. So, you know, when you look at all that and then you look at me when I first came here, um, I struggle with the language. Um, I was very intimidated by the culture. And, you know, um, a simple task as walking on the street for me was very complicated because I thought I can just go and walk on the streets just like what you saw in the picture, you know. Um, and then um, I got hunked at and, you know, people are like, you know, where are you going? And then I have to learn about um, uh, sidewalks. But, you know, think about this. Observation could be very, very deceiving because I spent the first three weeks when I first landed in, in Chicago, I spent three weeks just watching from my brother's apartment's balcony to see, like, if I decided to go out, how am I going to walk on the streets? Like, where on the street would I walk? And I kept watching and observing how people walk on the street. And, you know, I saw that, you know, um, on this, on that paved area between this, the main street, uh, from the main street, there is a grass area and there is the little paved area. And then there is the apartments. But when I kept looking, I saw that people who were using that part, that paved area, were you know, women pushing strollers, um, teenagers on um, roller skates, um, handicapped uh, or people on, on um, wheelchairs. Um, and I said, oh, that's why it's paved. It's for, you know, people on wheels. So then when I, you know, um, collected my strength and courage and I said, I'm going to go out, I'm going to walk on the streets of America, I walked right where the cars are. And I got hunked at, and people are like, you know, like where you're going. So then I, when I went, I j literally just went for five, seven minutes walk and went back. And I was like so upset and so angry. I didn't know what I did wrong. And when I told my brother, he said, well, you were walking on the street. And I said, well, where else were I'm supposed to walk? And he said, on the, on the sidewalk. I said, there is no such sidewalk. He took me and he showed me, he said, that paved area is called the sidewalk. I said, no, that's for people on wheels. And he said, no. So we argued, we argued for a good half an hour and we both agreed that, you know, he, that, that he respects that, um, that's what I believe in. And I said, you got it all wrong. And um, later on, I learned that it was the sidewalk, like when I moved to Mankato two years later. Um, actually, I take that back. Six months later, when I worked at Walgreens. Um, the other, um, so, you know, that's how I um, pretty much started my journey in the U.S. Um, I kept going to that Walgreens many, many times, but I never bought anything because I was so scared because I'm used to that supermarket you saw in the slideshow. And then when I went into Walgreens, I wanted to buy something. I said, um, I'm gonna use the theory of monkey see, monkey do. And I saw that people go in, they grab a cart and they push the cart and they take the stuff and they put it in the cart. So I started doing that. And I, you know, um, I came with this belief that they said, you're going to Chicago. It's one of the most dangerous cities in America. So you don't walk around with money, with a lot of money in your pocket. And you know, you don't, you, you don't be all friendly with people and you don't make eye contact and you just, you look down and if people approach you, you just run. So um, with that, um, and, you know, that belief or, or, or that was going on in my head, um, you know, my brother, I said, I can not just stay in the apartment, you know, nine, 10 hours a day waiting for you to come. And he said, well, just go out, just go for a walk. You know, there's so many places you can go. And I said, okay, well, I'm just going to go to the mall, uh, Walgreens. So I would go there and then 
the day I decided to buy something, I brought with me from home a dollar because if I get robbed, then it's just one dollar and it's not a, a big loss. So I walked in there and I, I remember walking down the aisles looking on the price tags to see, you know, something that shows a dollar. So I found a Hershey's bar that was for a dollar. So I took it, put it in the cart, pushed the cart and came to cashier to the cashier and she said, um, a dollar fifteen cents. I'm like, no, it's a dollar. And she said, no, it's a dollar fifteen with taxes. I said, I'm not buying any taxes. I'm just buying the chocolate. And she said, no, 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 you don't buy the taxes. You buy it, but you pay extra taxes. You know, it's for the government. I said, yeah, but I'm here legally. I don't have to pay extra. I'm, I'm you know, I have the green card. I'm a, I'm a legal resident. She said, you know, it's, it's okay. I'm just gonna put the 15 cents from my pocket. And I said, no, no, I, I have like $400 at home, but you know, I just don't understand. Why is it a dollar 15? It, it only says $1. She said, yes, but there is taxes. And I said, well, I don't know about taxes. And she said, well, that's what people pay for the government. I said, yes, but I already paid the government before I came to the US, it was just too complicated for both of us. And um, I took that uh, chocolate, but I was very, very um, humiliated. I, I felt humiliated that I do have money, but why no one explained something simple like this to me at the airport, for example, or when I was applying for the visa, why they didn't say that when you go buy stuff, you have to pay extra for taxes. So I went home and I felt so bad and I was so angry at my brother because he didn't tell me that. And he said, well, I wasn't with you. If I was with you, I would have explained. And, and I said, well, I feel so humiliated. I feel like I'm, I'm a, 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 a poor person, a beggar that, you know, that lady has to pay for my chocolate. And I felt so embarrassed to say, I don't want the chocolate, it's okay, take it back. Because, you know, she already, um, um, already put it in the register. So then I decided the next day, I will go and get a thank you card and put $2 uh, as a thank you. It's like 15 cents plus interest. But I mean, I thought it would be as a thank you for her. Um, and I gave it to her and she actually, she felt, um, she was so happy and so excited and um, she decided that it, to help me. She said, I, I've seen you coming in pretty much every day and you are in the store for hours, but you know, just happened yesterday that you actually bought something. And, and then I told her the whole story and she said, wow, you know, I didn't know. Well, first of all, I thought you were Mexican. And then, you know, you, you spoke English. Um, and, uh, and she said, but, you know, I just couldn't explain to you the tax part. And I thought maybe you just didn't have the change with you and it's 15 cents is nothing. And then we became friends and, and she said, well, you know, um, if you want, you can apply and you can get a job here and maybe that will help you so you want you're not too bored at home and you, maybe you'll make some money you know extra money and i actually ended up working at that walgreens but one of the things that i remember for me was also a culture shock at that walgreens that same day is when she wanted to scan because scan in my country is x-ray so when she wanted to scan that chocolate bar i got worried because i said you know, I'm normal. And she said, no, I'm scanning the merchandise, the bar. And I said, oh, and I thought something is wrong that she had to scan it to like prove if it's okay or edible to eat or not. So I was a little bit worried. That's before we even got to the taxes part. But that's just to tell you a little bit of, of how confusing it was. And I'm talking, this is me like um, in on my third month in, in the United States. And okay, so, uh, Cecile, I just wanted to say that we are over the 3.30 
scheduled ending time. We haven't lost many people, so that's a good thing. But I just did just want to say that maybe we should uh, look to wrap things up. Okay, so I will I will take the just two more minutes um, to tell you that I worked at Walgreens, that Walgreens, and it was a great help to me for a year and a half. However, I have a friend of the family who it was just killing her to see me that I was bilingual and I had um, a five years college degree in community health and I'm just working at that Walgreens and she said, you know, you, you could be doing so much better. Um, and she said, if you're willing to move to Minnesota, we, I'm a part of a committee that, um, that's piloting a, a new profession called community health worker. Um, so if you're willing to move, I can try and see if I can get you a scholarship. And I said, sure, you know, free education can get better than that. Um, so, and that's how I ended up getting a scholarship to go for the community health worker program at South Central. And that's when I moved to Mankato. And that's actually how I was first introduced to my American mom and grandma, which is Sue Frost and Annette Macbeth. Um, and I um, was supposed to be at, um, in Mankato for just the six month of the program. But while I was going to South Central, um, Annette, who was, uh, um, had just stepped down as a executive director of the YWCA in a transitioning period, um, she had told the, the, the new executive director, Angani, at that time, and she said, we have a new international student and, and she's looking for a job and community health is her background. And she arranged for a meeting and I went and I met Angani and I told her where I came from and my educational background and she told me about the mission of the YWCA and she said, so how do you see yourself in this organization? And the first thing that came to my head was that incident at Walgreens is I said, you know, I would love to have a program that would help immigrants and refugees like myself when they come from their, um, their native country into America and how to help them and guide them, um, you know, through the culture and the customs and, and the, um, the lifestyle differences and get them kind of, um, what's the word, aware or, um, you know, get them some knowledge about the American culture, American lifestyle and how things are and what taxes are and, you know, how you walk on the street and how you purchase things. And, and uh, we, she said, well, you know, let's, think about a name for this program. And I said at that time, you know, I was in America, but everything inside me was kind of working based on my life in Sudan. So I said, I, it felt like I'm walking in two different words, worlds where I have to jump from one world to the other as I'm, you know, living my new life in, in, in the U.S. And that's when we started the Walking in Two Worlds program at the YWCA. And I worked with immigrants and refugees um, like myself, and I was kind of figuring out things as I'm going. You know, they, anytime they will come up with a question that I don't know, I'll say, well, I'll go and get the information and come and share it with you. Um, and that was pretty much how I landed in Mankato from 2005 to 2009, and then moved to the cities for a different opportunity, um, work opportunity. And then I met my husband there and moved overseas from 2011 until this last March. And I was just itching to come back to, to the States and specifically to Mankato because I think that's where I lived the most and that's how um, I pretty much made my, um, my American family and um, pretty much a big chunk of, um, what do you call it, 
um, a very special era of my life is in Mankato. So I always wanted to just go back. And when Vine had the diversity program position open, I applied for it immediately. And um, uh, as soon as I was able to come, I just arranged everything. I, um, I actually got the offer in mid-February, end of February, I'm sorry. And I said I can come in April. However, um, toward, in mid-March, towards end of March, they were closing down because of Corona um, in Turkey. And I had booked my ticket for the 27th and I got a call that they're shutting down the airport on the 25th of March. So they said, you either leave on the 25th or we can refund your money. So I just packed whatever I could in two days earlier um, <clears throat> than my um, day of travel. And, um, and I took my son and we just, we were on the last flight leaving um, the Istanbul airport. So I, that's why I started this presentation saying I'm really, really lucky and happy to be here because I just, I barely made it here before everything just went terrible. I just want to thank you all so very much. And I really apologize for the lengthy presentation. I hope we, really hopeful I haven't bored you to death. Oh, so. No, no. <laughs> I would say, it's all very interesting. <laughs> okay. By the looks of the smiles, I would say everything's good. Okay. It was good, Cecile. It was good. Thank you, Grandma. You're kind I of biased, know. so. I know about you. <laughs> <laughs> and I did mention in the chat box that uh, this is the first of many that, presentations that we hope Cecile will uh, present for us talking about the different aspects of the Vine diversity program once we really get the chance to launch those or maybe even before. So uh, I will take this opportunity also to thank you all for coming and we will wrap things up. Look for this uh, online pretty soon otherwise and I will I will apologize then for all of the technical difficulties. We had a bit of a challenge here so we will do better next time. It was fun. Thank you, Mike and Cecile. You make a good team. All right. Thank you. Well, Thank he, you. Take, he takes all the credit. Let me just say that. I don't take it all. <laughs> 90%. You might, you might give it to me, but I'm not going to take it. <laughs> all right. I just want to say, if you, if you have any questions, if there's anything you would like to know more about Sudan or about myself or about the program, um, you can either send an email or you can call me. My email is, is very easy. It's cecile at vinevolunteers.com. Um, or, you know, my phone number is 387-5582. That's my direct number at Vine. 387-386, wait, 386, I'm sorry, 386-5582. And again, thank you so much for um, attending this long presentation. And um, I, I really hope that would be a start for many more that would be less lengthy next time. Thank you. All thank right. you and have a great thank afternoon. You, Very good. Thank you. Good job. Bye. 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 Bye, Mom. Bye, Deb. Bye, Mary. Bye. <laughs>